It's estimated to be a 32 billion, with a B, 32 billion dollar industry and growing. It's people that you would never imagine, and they get away with it because nobody would ever accuse them of it. Most of them said they serviced about eight to 10 men a night and that they saw no way out. I felt like every dream and every goal that I had died that Friday night. I turned to drugs and alcohol as a way of trying to make myself feel better. It's hard to get an accurate number of how many slaves there are in the world today. So the estimates that you hear most frequently are 27 million people. A lot of people have heard the term human trafficking. They don't necessarily know what it means, that that's the term we use for modern day slavery. The three words that are, are the le part of the legal definition of human trafficking um, are force, fraud, or coercion. So any time that somebody is through force, fraud, or coercion, um, having to perform, whether it's a sex commercial sexual act or labor or something else, for somebody else's benefit, and they are not, um, not, you know, not able to choose, not able to choose to leave. The abuse started at a very early age with my stepfather. When the human trafficking part came in, though, um, it was right after I turned 15, by a family friend that was really high up in our community. And it began innocent enough in my eyes. I thought that the relationship was normal. There became this relationship between us and it was always a, an unspoken thing of don't tell anyone that this is going on and um, nobody would understand and you don't want people to be jealous or to try to break this up what we have. So I didn't tell anyone. And then eventually that wasn't enough for him and that's when the idea came out about um, prostitution. And at that point I think my self-esteem was so low that I would have done anything that he asked to keep him around. But at the same time that all of this was going on, I was still living this double life of going to school the next day and put on the happy face and I was, you know, the cheerleading captain and I had everything put together and nobody knew that, you know, during the day I'm this perfect student and at night, you know, I'm sleeping with whoever he wants me to sleep with. When the person who's being trafficked is under the age of 18, then it's automatically considered trafficking. In other words, legally, a 14-year-old girl cannot choose to be a prostitute, and that's the term we use, somebody is being prostituted, um, that that is not a choice and they're actually a victim of human trafficking. No young girl says, gee, what do I want to be? Do I want to be an astronaut? Do I want to be a teacher? Do I want to be an attorney or do I want to be a prostitute? I don't know, they all sound good. Nobody does that, it's not a choice. My family moved into an area that we thought, or they thought, was a safe neighborhood. And so right around 13, a couple moved into the neighborhood. They got to know all the parents. They came to the school. They became part of the school, although they didn't have any children. They were um, monitors and PT, part of the PTA and chaperones. And then when I turned 15 years old, they asked four girls, including myself, to go to New York City. And at, you know, at 15 years old, we all begged our parents to go. Finally, when I got a yes from my parents, um, I was the last person to get that yes, and we went off to New York City. We were told that we were gonna go shopping and to see a Broadway show. Well, we get there, we did go shopping. However, right around eight o'clock, we were taken back to a hotel and we were given some clothes and told that if we didn't put these clothes on, we'll never make it back home to see our parents again. I was scared. I mean, they put the fear of God in you, literally. Um, they told us that if we did tell, they would kill our parents. Um, they told us we would be killed. I didn't tell anyone. I um, was going to school one day and I saw his car pull up in our parking lot and I started to run. And when I started to run, he told me to get in the car. His brother got out the car and snatched me. And that's when they kept me for eight months. 
Well, during that eight month period, um, he had about 15 girls. And I really can't remember, um, it, he had a lot of boys too. It was probably like 10 to 12 boys um, that he was selling into prostitution. And we went all over the country. We went to every like sporting event. He did a lot of NFL games. He did a lot of quarter horse shows. Um, he was pretty high end. We were never involved in street prostitution. It was pretty high end. Human trafficking is actually now considered the second largest criminal activity in the world. Drug trafficking would be first, and then human trafficking is second, overtaking illegal arms sales. And the reason that it's becoming such a huge problem is that it's so profitable. People think, well, this is all about sex, and that's part of it, but it's really all about money. And the price worldwide, the average price of a slave is $90. You know, growing up, I had the perfect life from the perfect family. Everyone thought I had it all together. You know, I was really involved in school. I was homecoming queen, student council president. You know, everything looked good. But really, it was a mask that I was wearing all through school, covering up that pain and confusion that I had inside of being sexually abused by my own stepdad. And this was a guy in our community who was well-respected, who was loved. No one would have ever suspected that this was going on you know, behind closed doors. And so I sort of packed it away for years and um, just thought, if I can just get through my childhood to 18, then I'll be fine. You know, no one talked about sexual abuse, so I didn't know other than to believe what my stepfather told me. And I was afraid of what would happen if I did tell. Um, but finally, at the age of 14, I did. I found the courage to tell my mom. She actually believed me, which isn't very common in the stories that I hear. And um, she reported it. We were in hiding. And seven days later, my stepdad killed himself. And I can tell you that just totally rocked my world. Um, I felt like everything that I was, my identity, my family was just completely shattered. I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, so I decided I was gonna put my secret back under lock and key and not talk about it again. And so I did that for a while, but over time I realized that in order to heal from my past and my childhood, I had to talk about it. I had to find my voice and to break the silence about sexual abuse. I think when people hear the word John, they think of this monster. And unfortunately, it's not just something that you have this, the person has a big arrow over their head saying, I'm a John, look at me. Like, they are sneaky. It is your everyday person. The people that I ran into were people that had a high status in the community. And they were supposed to be the people we could trust. Plus, a lot of the people I dealt with knew my family personally, so they were people that I had grown up around. To think that a trafficker or a pimp is just a guy is wrong, um, because there are females that are traffickers, and a lot of times these guys that are like the main trafficker will use a woman to help recruit you. And so we actually, I was probably more closer to his wife, who we found out later was his first victim. Um, and she was a teen victim when he got hurt. And so um, they are very, very slick. Um, he is very charismatic, very loving, very attentive. And so um, sometimes when, when girls are so vulnerable to getting the attention um, that they're not getting from somewhere else, and that's one huge way where these guys can lure them in. What we've noticed is that so many times these pimps are looking for young girls who um, probably don't have a father figure or are being abused at home. They, they find them in the malls and you know they, they try to buy them with their words or with money or with fame or with the idea that they're going to get a modeling contract or they just try to fill broken girls minds with things that sound like the answer for the hole that's in their heart because most of them have been sexually abused as kids or they're in a very broken home and they're looking for a daddy type or someone who's going to take care of them and so um, that's often the situation that we've found here in America. Some of the red flags are when you see a kid with a hotel room key and they're not 18. Well, somebody's giving them that hotel room key. When you see them with a lot of money, 
Branding is a huge thing right now for these victims. Um, I just read an article where um, one pimp is branding these kids and tattooing their eyelids. Um, so branding is huge. You see a, a name here, or now they even use a logo. They may not use their name, they'll use a logo, and that's absolutely a red flag. It takes on many different forms. Um, it's your next door neighbor, it's your best friend, it's, you know, the girl at the checkout line. Like, it doesn't discriminate against anybody. I think uh, one of the things that parents should do ultimately is communicate with your children. Have that open door with your children because these kids don't have a safe place to go to. They're, they're, they're not, your parents will never ever know. I think the biggest thing is finding somebody that you can open up to and to bring light onto those secrets because it is too big of a burden to carry on your own. Um, I was really lucky that I had some people that came alongside me that supported me and got me talking and got me sharing my story and if it weren't for them I don't know where I would be. For years I felt like I was alone, that I was the only person who'd gone through this childhood that I'd experienced and it wasn't until I began to find my voice and start sharing my story that I realized that I wasn't alone. So many people were saying, you know, me too. And that, I guess, helped me understand the complexity of these issues and how often it happens that we are not alone. You know, if, if you've been sexually abused, if you've been trafficked, you're not alone. And that there is hope, you know, that the things that we've gone through were not our fault. This is an evil that is unfortunately become an epidemic around the world and it's taking children um, as victims and we are victims but we can be survivors and that's the point is that we don't have to remain victims the rest of our lives that there's healing available that there's people there's organizations that want to help not only end this issue but to wrap their arms around the survivors that have been affected by this issue. The survivors are starting to speak out more about the issue, and I think the more survivors that come forth and say, this did happen to me, our future is very bright. Do you think this nightmare will end? I believe that we will abolish human trafficking.